Hi, everybody. My name is David Crummy. I am the um, current chair of the Arizona Community Reinvestment Collaborative. Um, welcome, everybody, to our little coffee chat. It sounds like we have a number of people from um, multiple places across the country joining us here in Arizona. Um, we're a, uh, just a little bit about the ACRC is that we're a coalition of um, financial institutions that have a CRA need, and we bring, come together to talk about issues that are unique <clears throat> to nonprofits serving our low and moderate income communities and small businesses, and how that intersects with the banking um, sector. We're a membership organization and open to any financial institution that has a CRA obligation in Arizona. Um, membership dues are $2,500 a year, and we use all of that to support Blisk Phoenix and put out grants um, once a year. Um, so this year we're able to put out a $30,000 grant um, to a small organization that will be announced soon and also um, mini grants to our um, four other finalists. So we gave each of our finalists a $1,000 mini grant for, um, for applying. Um, altogether, all of our banks represent about 87% of the deposit share in Arizona. And uh, so we're pretty representative of everyone. Um, and then we have a bunch of upcoming events um, the biggest ones that we have coming up right now are in August. Uh, we have three Spanish language um, small business events with uh, both banks, credit unions, and then also our technical assistance and CDFI partners will be hold, hosting two in the Phoenix area and one in Tucson. Um, and there will be an email coming out um, from Lisk Phoenix with those details. And then just everybody, we have our membership meeting coming up August 27th um, and December 1st. And then we are going to be coordinating an interagency event with um, the three regulators and our nonprofit community uh, towards the end of the year. So keep your eyes open for that. And if you'd like to get involved, please join us. Um, you can either email myself, Frida, or um, Art Perez over at US Bank and will help you uh, get connected. So with that, um, our talk today is um, about understanding EQ2's equity equivalent investments. And so with us today, we have Annie from American Express, Paul from PNC Bank, and Kathleen from LISC. And I'm going to let them each introduce themselves, um, and then we'll get into it. And then um, we'll open it up for uh, questions. If you have any, throw them in the chat. And at the end, you can just unmute yourself and we can um, get in there um, and ask, but uh, we'll get going. So Annie, can you uh, take a moment and introduce yourself? Sure thing. Thanks, David. So my name is Annie Perizzolo. As David mentioned, I work for American Express. I'm currently the CRA director over our program management team. So I really focus on communications with our regulators and that type of thing. But I just recently moved from being over our loans and investments team where we originated investments such as EQ2s. So I'm very familiar with EQ2s and their impact on any of our CRA regulatory items. And just for a point of reference as well, I used to consult for the CDFI fund. So I've kind of seen EQ2s from both sides of the coin and we'll be touching on that a little later. Thank you so much. Paul. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Paul Bunyard, I work for PNC Bank as David referenced. Uh, prior, I worked at BBVA before PNC acquired uh, BBVA. And I've also been on the other side working for a CDFI that obviously had uh, structures of several EQ2s and other investments. Uh, my background, I was at BBVA primarily the uh, called the loan officer or investment officer originating our CRA investments. And if you read into that, it was our CDFI EQ2 investments across the platform of the bank. Uh, I'm based in Denver, Colorado, and I cover the Colorado, De I'm sorry, Colorado, Arizona and New Mexico markets for both the CRA, our community relations team, as well as we have a de dedicated lender who handles the origination of portfolio management of our investments such as these. Paul's also my manager. So any nice things go to him and any complaints, please send to me. 
Um, and then finally, last but definitely not least, Kathleen. Thanks. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you today. My name is Kathleen Keefe, and I'm the Investor Relations Lead at Local Initiative Support Corporation, or LISC. We're a national CDFI loan fund, and I sit on our New York-based treasury team, where in my role, I lead portfolio analysis on our more than $700 million loan portfolio. I also manage our capital markets program, LISC Impact Notes, and the regular reporting we do to our lenders and investors. So I am looking forward to representing the voice of an EQ2 recipient and to speak a little bit more about how EQ2s are really high impact in helping finance community development. Awesome. Um, so I'm just going to... Um hand this over to you, Annie, and um, just indicate when you're ready to move slides or I'll just vibe with it. <laughs> we'll work on both. Uh, we can actually go ahead and go to the next slide though. So the first thing we wanted to do as a group was just introduce what an EQ2 is. And I'll point this out as an important piece on multiple fronts. So the first thing is in order to be counted as an EQ2, in the legal documents, there has to be evidence of these six criteria. So as we go through this, in general, the way to think about an EQ2 is a long-term, deeply subordinated loan, which means it functions like equity for, well, which means that it, it can function like equity, and this will play out in a few ways. So the first piece is the EQ2 has to be carried as an investment on the bank's balance sheet. So that means if I make an EQ2 to Kathleen, it is going to show up as a investment asset on American Express's balance sheet. But it is then considered a general obligation for the nonprofit organization. So on Kathleen's balance sheet, it looks like a liability. It does have to be fully subordinated to any other loan, but it can be peri parsu with other EQ2s. So it's kind of last in line for any repayment. Um, you do not get to accelerate the payment. So I cannot call an EQ2 early for, as a bank unless there is some issue with normal business operations. So if you cease being a CDFI, if you decide to change the type of work you do, I'm able to call the EQ2 early, but otherwise it has to live out its full life. Um, it has to carry an interest rate that's not tied to any income. So if I can't raise your interest rate, if I see your business, performance decreasing. I also can't lower the interest rate if I decide something else that has to just be what it is based on our agreement. And then the final one, and I think this is the one that's always up for the most debate that I've heard. I'd be curious to hear Paul and Kathleen's conversations on this. It has to have a rolling term and therefore an indeterminate maturity. Um, I'll talk about this in a second, but the way American Express looks at this generally is that there is a set maturity date but one year before that set maturity date, we all have to agree that that is going to be the true maturity date, or we will continue, continually annually renew that until we agree that the EQ2 will mature. With, there we go. <laughs> um, and so I think there's always a few questions that I've seen on the bank side of an EQ2, which is why would a bank even do this, right? It sounds like it is a loan that's going to get repaid last if there's any bankruptcy it sounds like the interest rate may be lower than anything else we see. And what I'm going to say is it's all for CRA. So for those that are not familiar with it, um, Community Reinvestment Act is a bank's regulatory obligation, or I'd say an encouragement from the regulators to support low and moderate income communities within the bank's footprint. Um, depending on the size and type of bank, each bank has a different type of test it needs to do. I will say most banks are always gonna have a community development investment test, which is where EQ2s could be counted. Um, Paul will also go over this, but there's a number of items that count as CRA qualified activities. So you can do affordable housing, economic development, revitalization, community services. The way American Express looks at EQ2s is it falls within economic development and we also count this as a responsive and complex investment. 
Um, this is important because banks not only need to show a certain level of investments to the regulators, but you also have to show that these investments are useful to those that you're providing them to. The last and final piece, and again, I think Paul may touch on this as well, is the agencies or the regulators put out something called a Q&A for CRA, which kind of guides banks to, to show what counts and what doesn't count for qualified activities. And they've explicitly called out that investments, direct, investments and loans directly to CDFIs are CRA qualified, and that's because of that CDFI certification. Um, there are a few other ways that EQ2s may occur, but a direct EQ2 to a CDFI is always going to count as a CRA qualified activity where a investment in, I'll say, a, a subsidiary of a CDFI may not count. I did see a question pop up real quick. I'm just going to read it. Um, okay, so the question is, can you offer multiple EQ2s to the same entity for a different purpose? Yes, you can. Um, Paul, I'd be curious if you had any thoughts on that. I can say American Express has done multiple EQ2s. We actually offer EQ2s as a general purpose for lending. So you can only use it for lending activities, but a general purpose lending investment and so we don't say that it has to go to one program or another um, and we usually are offering multiple EQ2s to a CDFI just to spread out their kind of asset liability match and the timing of maturity. All right David if you want to switch to the next one. And this is going to give more background on why American Express has done EQ2s. The, the first thing I'll say is we're actually a nationally chartered bank with only one assessment area. My assessment area is not actually Arizona, but I have multiple EQ2s to Arizona institutions. And so that is because as a limited purpose bank, we one, have a very small footprint, and two, we have a large need to do investments, but we don't... Um, I would say we don't have a specific retail program like Paul will have. So Paul may touch on that, but we have a little bit more flexibility in the types of investments we're able to offer with this limited purpose designation. Um, with this designation, we really focus on community development investments that are either within our assessment area, which is usually where those low-income housing tax credits come from in new markets. But then we're also able to say what better aligns with American Express's business model, which is small business credit cards, to be honest. And so we try to find other economic development type activities, such as equity funds that either focus on affordable housing or economic development, or EQ2s to better support economic development in those areas. Um, one of the items that we also like to do, and I mentioned this a little bit on the other slide, is we always like to make sure we're doing something innovative or overly responsive to community needs. For an OCC Insights publication in 2014, any partnership with CDFIs, and the OCC is my regulator, definitely calls out as not necessarily innovative every time, but very responsive to community needs because they consider CDFIs as the community experts. And that's, again, where I'll say the direct investment to the CDFI itself is very important because it, um, it shows that you are working with someone that knows the community well. And I think my question might be, yeah, I was like, my question might be answered a little later. So I'm going to leave that one on the side there in the chat. When American Express is looking at making EQ2s, we look for a few things. So the first thing I'll say is we look for a, a CD5 that has a geographic footprint that matches with our target CRA areas. We only have one assessment area, which is your bank. You'll kind of know that CRA terminology which is Salt Lake. If anyone knows the CDFI Salt Lake market, there are only two certified CDFIs in Salt Lake. So there's, we've done the work we can do there. And so we start to spread out after that. We really like to look for areas where American Express has a employee office, which is why we've actually done a lot of work in Arizona and Phoenix itself, because we have a employment center in Arizona. The next thing we like to do is look for CDFIs whose business lines focus on our CRA strategy. As I mentioned, American Express's general strategy is small business credit cards and credit cards. And so we like to find CDFIs that support small business as well. And then this isn't, I'll say the final or least important piece, but we really like to find CDFIs that have a capital stack that can support the EQ2 product and repayment. And what that means is we know we're gonna be subordinated. We know that this product looks different than a true loan. Um, 
And we are unlikely to do that to a new and emerging CDFI just because the capital stack itself is, is going to have a hard time supporting the EQ2. But I think it is a good product for a more mature CDFIs. In terms of what we look at once we've kind of had an initial conversation with the CDFI about an EQ2, I would say the due diligence for a loan underwriting and EQ2 underwriting are very similar, right? We're going to look at your audited financial statements, your strategic plan, your management and board biographies, any governments and procedures documents in place. Honestly, one of the more important things we look at as well is your lending policies. Our repayment is really dependent on how the CDFI loan portfolio is performing. And so we really look at the CDFI's loan portfolio as well. Um, the thing I call out here at the end, oh, you're good, David, is just that we do a camels analysis, right? So a lot of the questions we're asking is going to sound pretty banky. And it's because we're looking at CDFIs as loan funds, as someone that has a capital structure, has a loan portfolio where we can review the asset quality, their management, their earnings, and their liquidity. The mm -hmm. thing I'll note with this is we also look at these metrics in a CDFI lens. We're not expecting every CDFI to be fully self-sufficient. That is not usually how CDFIs operate. We're not looking for excessive amounts of earnings because that's not how CDFIs operate, but we are still looking at each of those components just to see the general performance of the CDFI itself. And the last thing I wanted to touch on again is just how our relationship continues with CDFIs once an EQ2 is in place. Um, the first thing I'll say is we have a grant program and an investment program at American Express. So we generally always pair our EQ2s with grant dollars, with the idea being that the grant dollars are always going to go to funding allowance for loan loss or loan loss reserves for the CDFIs. Because if we provide you an EQ2, we're expecting you to um, originate more loans and therefore you're going to need a larger loan loss reserve. In addition to that, this is again going to sound much like a normal loan, I would say we have general quarterly reporting requirements, annual financial reporting requirements, and then those standard kind of notices of any change in management and business. The one piece I'd like to highlight here, and this is going to round out to tying this back to being a CRA product, is we also require quarterly impact reporting. And part of that is because the OCC asks us if we you know, what impact our investment is having. So we like to see what loans and what impact the CDFI themselves is having so that we can kind of show that as a piece of it. Um, I think that is the end of mine, David, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so with that, I will pass it off to Paul. Thank you. Um, thank you, Annie. Fantastic. As you can imagine, me and Annie had a lot of very similar slides, so she covered a lot that I don't have to cover now. But you did dive in. Um, I will start off by just saying kind of on the CRA 101 side, American Express and PNC are very different banks. As Annie represented, you know, they have one area in Salt Lake City. PNC is a national bank where our, our obligations are to where we have physical branches and taking physical deposits. And what does that mean? And I'll pick on Arizona, obviously Phoenix, Tucson, and then we also have some more rural markets, uh, Flagstaff and some others. So when we're providing any investments, we are definitely looking at it through the lens of are the organizations that we're utilizing these funds for able to deploy funds in the markets where we have physical locations, branches, and therefore CRA needs. Um, very similar to American Express, our business model, we look at the bank itself, how much mortgage volume do we do versus small business? And that sets, I'll say, kind of a pie graph of how much we want to support affordable housing, economic development, to show that we're supporting organizations that are, in essence, with who we're doing business with as a bank in general. Um, Annie completely hit on the, the underwriting. I'll dive in the details a little bit later on another slide. Um, but I was going to speak more to the credit profile of who a CDFI or kind of who a target client is for an EQ2, at least through our institution. Uh, as it says here, the certified CDFI must be a certified CDFI. They need to have an experienced management team. And I say for the size and complexity of organizations, LISC is a huge CDFI, I think probably the largest, if not the largest in the United States. And there's some that are very small micro CDFIs that might have one employee. So when we're underwriting, we're definitely just looking at does the management team fit the profile of the organization itself and have the ability to manage it? And then, of course, we're looking at the financial statements. Do they have historical performance? We really heavily look at the loan portfolio performance. As Annie said, that's our repayment source. 
ultimately at some point in time for either the debt or the EQ2 that we're doing. It's not profitability by the organization. We're not expecting to make enough profits to pay back the EQ2. It's really you deploy it into a, a loan fund. You grow your loan fund at some point in time. Hopefully, if that loan fund uh, ever ever got collected, that would be a way to pay us back or, or raise other capital. Uh, and again, I already mentioned this one. The CFI has the ability to deploy in assessment areas and markets that we work. And I'll put a, a finer point on this. When we carry an EQ2, as Annie said, these are investments on our balance sheet. So when we're getting tested for investments under CRA, what you're really talking about is what is the bank doing for low-income housing tax credits, new market tax credits for buying equity, EQ2s, and then to a lesser extent, we can buy into certain private equity funds that are CRA qualified or mortgage-backed securities. As a very high level, our program at the bank, we typically fund a lot of low-income housing tax credit projects and new market tax credit projects in our larger markets. So in a Phoenix, Tucson, the chances that we do a larger transaction, smaller market, they happen. In fact, they happened in Arizona last year, but the, the, the opportunities are much more limited there. So we as a bank typically look at the markets that we probably wouldn't have a LIHTC opportunity or a new market tax credit opportunity. That's where we try to first start targeting our EQ2. So in the Arizona market, it, it'd likely be outside of Phoenix, maybe in the Tucson or some of the smaller markets. And then as we get closer to the end of our exam period, which is three to four years, ours is a four year period. Then if we have holes, we haven't been able to attract an investment into some of the larger markets and we try to fill gaps with EQ2s because it's a pretty easy tool for us to come in and, and fill a gap. The bank has very, very uh, strongly committed to supporting CDFIs as well as part of our $88 billion overall community benefits plan. We committed to do $100 million a year into CDFI investments, both EQ2 and senior level debt or other debt products. And I would say about 25% of that $100 million a year is what's allocated to EQ2s. Again, that's a budget uh, question as well, since we do not typically make money on the EQ2 product. So uh, David, I'll let you go to the next slide. So again, the other products that we offer to CDFIs, it's revolving lines of credit, could be operating lines of credit, could be used to support uh, the up and down of your loan portfolio as it goes. Those are typically structured as a shorter term, one to two year term, they renew annually. Uh, we can also do uh, term debt. The most common structure that we do at PNC might be a seven year total term up to a two year draw period. So you're not getting dinged with interest to use the funds until you deploy it. But as you deploy it over those two years, you, you advance it and then we lock it in interest only payments, a balloon at maturity. That's the most common structure that we see. And then finally, if it's a for-profit CDFI, which there are a few of them out there, there's not a ton, uh, we can actually buy stock into the organization itself. So go ahead to the next slide, David. Uh, all right, so underwriting and in the weeds, the stuff that is always the most unfun to talk about. When we are looking at CDFIs, I feel the greatest need for EQ2s or a great need is with CDFIs that are emerging coming up. But as Annie mentioned, a lot of times that's the most challenging profile for us because we are doing the, the same analysis as if we did a loan or an investment to the organization. And we have our underwriting that as the organization grows, they have more ability to take on additional debt and additional EQ2. Uh, but as a general, if we're doing an EQ2 investment, we need to be at par with everybody else. And what does that mean on a, let's say a startup CDFI, it's not uncommon that the first or second investor will want to secure all the assets of the organization to support their loan or their investment. That really inhibits any other bank from coming in to do an EQ2. We want everybody to be unsecured, everybody to be at the same level. Um, and that's a very common structure that you'll see within CDFIs. A lot of the senior debt's all unsecured. Some could be secured to some organizations, but that's a key criteria that we look at. We're looking for a minimum of two years reviewed or audited financial statements. Annie mentioned the CAMEL analysis, the capital, the assets, the management, and liquidity. We, we do the same analysis that we're looking at. We're looking at trends in your portfolio. We're looking at the management team and how long they've been with the organization and their background. Um, and then finally, when we're sizing an EQ2, we, we look at a global debt service coverage. But as Annie mentioned, you likely are not self-sufficient or you may be self-sufficient, but the profitability of the organization is not intended to pay back the principal of the EQ2. So as we look at a global debt service, we actually assume that you probably collect about 50% to 75% of your current account receivables and add that into it. So when we're looking at, would you have the ability in essence to shrink the organization if you had to, to pay us back? That's really kind of what that is. And then a maximum leverage, we look at all the debt that the organization has, and we include EQ2 debt into this. We actually look at two different ratios, um, but we don't like the organization to have over more than three to four times 
debt to equity. So again, the startup organizations typically are funded with grants to kind of get you going. And then you get your balance sheet to a point that you're able to take on additional debt and, and EQ2s. Um, David, I'll let you go to the next slide. Uh, Annie really hit on this, but yeah, any investment that the bank makes to a CDFI, as long as we're making that investment directly to a CDFI, the entity itself, it's an automatic qualifier for CRA. We do try to diversify our portfolio. I think I heard Annie say in American Express, they look at all their EQ2s as economic development. We don't. We look at individual organizations. So if it's an affordable housing uh, CDFI, we're making an EQ2. We actually count that as an affordable housing investment on our books versus economic development. If it's a small business uh, CDFI, then we would count that as economic development. We try to diversify across the spectrums. We are seeing more of the sophisticated CDFIs coming up with off-balance sheet funds. Uh, and just kind of a quick note, Nanny hit it a little bit. Those are not automatic qualifiers for CRA. If it's not going directly to the entity, we would then have to understand who you're lending to and make sure that all the loans within that pool would be CRA qualified. Um, so a lot of in the weeds information, but David, I'll let you move forward. And I believe that's the end of my slides. Before we jump too quick um, from you, Paul, uh, how do you come up with pricing or how, how do different uh, banks approach pricing? There's the million dollar question. Now, uh, in, in general, Annie said there's really no relation to credit risk. There's no relation to um, uh, to how the, how the organization itself underwrites. At PNC, we price at our cost of funds minus a spread. And that's the general, um, that's our general pricing model. And occasionally, if there's one that's a real high impact, you know, maybe we have a very strong CRA need in Birmingham, Alabama, and we're not seeing a lot of opportunities, the pricing may be a concession that we'd be willing to go a little bit lower at. But I would say in general right now, EQ2s that I'm seeing are pricing around three to three and a half. Annie, do you have any feedback or do you have any thoughts on how you guys look at that? I would say we do it relatively similarly. Um we have a slightly higher cost of funds right now, so I wish we could do 3%, but I think we're we're a little bit higher in that range. Um, and Paul also touched on that, right? We're not looking at EQ2s as like this major profit maker, but at the same time, I need to be able to get this EQ2 through my risk committee. And if I take something that's, you know, 300 basis points below cost of funds, I I will probably be rejected. Yeah. All right, it looks like I'm up next. So I'll dive in, thanks, um, thanks Paul. Um, as mentioned up top, I'm here to share this perspective of a CDFI recipient of EQ2s. So I wanted to start out by um, sharing some context on LISC, who we are and our work. So I put the mission of LISC here, which is to forge resilient and inclusive communities of opportunity across the US. We are one of the country's largest uh, community development organizations and the largest nonprofit CDFI. Um, under that banner, we act as an investor. So we invest capital in the communities where we work in the form of debt equity and grants. We connect partners and resources and we innovate and design uh, systems change solutions. So to share some background on how we got here and our impact today, we were founded in 1979. And since then we've been supporting the communities where we work. So for more than 40 years, we have offices in 38 markets across the US. Some of you on this call maybe are most familiar with our LISC Phoenix office, um, but we have 37 urban offices and a rural program that has a presence that reaches into more than 2,400 counties. The projects that we finance range across asset classes and impact themes. You can see some of our stats here, but we invest in projects that support everything from affordable housing to the arts and education, healthcare, access to nutritious food. We finance childcare services and small women and uh, entrepreneurs of color owned businesses. So really we try to meet the needs of the diverse communities where we work. To date, we've invested more than $32 billion across these communities. We can go to the next slide. So how do EQ2s fit into this picture? Since inception, LISC has received more than $85 million in EQ2 debt to support our work. As of quarter one of 2024, we had 12 EQ2s outstanding that totaled $47.1 million. Um, 
On the terms of the EQ2s, they ranged for us from between 1% to 3%. The loan size, the EQ2 size, ranged from $1 to $13 million per EQ2. And overall, as a percentage of LISC's debt, that's about 7% of our overall debt outstanding. Um, as Annie talked about, EQ2s have inherent characteristics that benefit CDFIs. I'll touch on some of the key benefits as they relate to LISC. First up is strengthening our capital structure. So CDFIs really are not able to rely solely on grants or philanthropic sources of capital to grow our permanent capital base. Though grants provide excellent flexibility and they have the benefit to us of not needing to be repaid, they're really, really time intensive to pursue and we're constrained by the limited availability of grants. So EQ2s are a terrific solution for this. They function like equity. They have those equity-like characteristics we're looking for uh, without some of the same, same constraints. And therefore, they're much more suitable for us to strengthen our capital structure and to use for growing our lending business. Um, secondly, the rolling term of EQ2s makes it easier for us to offer more responsive financing products to meet our borrowers' needs. <coughs> Excuse me. For example, it's more feasible to us to offer longer term loans, like a seven year mini perm loan um, to our borrowers when we have that longer term EQ2 debt capital to support that type of deal. Um, favorable rates is the third one. Typically EQ2s are deeply subordinate. They're below, they're below market rates, it's concessionary rather. Um, and they help CDFIs lower our own cost of capital. And we are then able to pass the lower cost of capital, the benefits of this on to our borrowers in the form of lower interest rate loans. Um, and lastly, because EQ2s are deeply subordinated, other senior lenders are protected from losses and between the strength and capital structure um, that they give CDFIs and this protection from losses, EQ2s can help leverage in other debt. They can help make CDFIs overall a more attractive uh, investment for our lenders. All right, so now I will share an overview of how we treat EQ2s on our balance sheet. As Annie mentioned, we treat them um, differently. Um, for a CDFI, we group EQ2s along with our other payable debt. So they show up as a liability under our loans and bonds payable line. Um, I pulled in a snapshot um, from our year-end financial statement. That first box at the top of the screen shows LISC's overall loans and bonds payables at year-end. That's $664 million. Um, and then we break that out in our financial notes. So um, note 10, that box in the middle, breaks out our loans and bonds payable by our um, investor type. And then we provide a write-up on our subordinated debt. So as of year-end 2023, we had subordinated debt that includes $53.1 million in the form of 12 EQ2 investments from eight financial institutions and one patient capital loan from one financial institution. So that's kind of how we present it. But also Annie had mentioned earlier um, uh, some discussion around Evergreen and rolling terms. And so I'll just pause to note that um, that one patient capital loan from one financial institution that it hits on that a little bit because that is a, essentially an EQ2-like investment. It's subordinated debt from one of our lenders who no longer felt comfortable using the term EQ2 because that, um, that source of debt has a maturity date. And since a typical EQ2 is evergreen, it has the rolling term, they said, well, this, this doesn't have that. This has a maturity date. So we're going to call it um, a patient capital loan. All right, I'll move on now to a few stories of how EQ2s are deployed to create impact in the communities where we work. I have pulled three stories from our portfolio where we used EQ2 capital. So the first one is Parkside Terrace. This was a $475,000 loan that supported an affordable housing apartment complex in Tucson, Arizona. And I really liked this project um, because it supported a very diverse community. So the residents of Parkside Terrace were low income, elderly, and special needs. And on top of that, uh, the community was adjacent to a number of amenities. Um, it's close to a park, a community center, and other features that 
make the, the, the homes where these people are living not just affordable, but also a vibrant community and a really great place to live. The next project to feature is the Metropolitan. So we'll look across the country in Newark, New Jersey. So LISC is providing a three and a half million dollar pre-development loan to support a new mixed income rental building in Newark. Um, the project is gonna provide a number of affordable units in the central business district. As you can see, there's 67 units of the 207 set aside for households making no more than 50% AMI. On top of that, uh, green financing has become a real focus of our work at LISC. And uh, this EQ2 is supporting a project that meets Enterprise Green Communities Plus standards, which is an aggressive green standard for affordable housing developments. Um, lastly, uh, we provided a $2.27 million loan, which is debt refinancing to assist our borrower Rock USA. Many of you may be familiar with Rock USA. I know they appeared on John Oliver and they've been in the news quite a bit. Um, but Rock USA is an organization that helps homeowners gain economic security through resident ownership of their manufactured home communities. So in this instance, Rock USA was helping the community of Pasadena Trails purchase the underlying property of their community. Um, not only does this project help preserve ownership of 114 manufactured home units, but for the residents, it also helps increase um, their housing stability and their economic stability and outlook. And that's, that's how I'll pass it back over. Well, thank you all. And that was sort of like this little whirlwind uh, overview of EQ2s. But um, I see we have about 32 people on the call, but more than happy to um, ask some questions and uh, we can throw those out there. Um, Andre in the, the chat, he had asked the question about the criter criteria and target asset size. And so I think the other question that um, would be interesting is how do you look at sizing the EQ2 um, for different organizations? I can jump first if you want, Annie. Um, <clears throat> we actually do as part of that Campbell analysis, it, we, we come up with some quantitative, some qualitative scoring, and it scores the CDFI based on a risk rating scale, I'll say from you know outstanding to substandard, which obviously we would not be doing a new investment to a substandard. But based on that rating of the strength of the CDFI, we then apply a couple different metrics to it of, we don't want to be more than a certain percent of your total assets, a certain percent of leverage, like the total leverage in the fund. Uh, we don't, um, uh, we look at liquidity, but candidly, like the liquidity is one that we always probably trip over our sizing the most. And then we, we, we mitigate that. But I'd say the primary ones are, we don't want to be more than a total percent of creditors in general. We don't want to be more than a total amount of net assets, total assets of the organization, not net assets. Um, and then we just look at some of the, the strength of the CD5 when determining that. And on our side, so I would say, and you know, this isn't written in policy or stone, but I think that our general is we like to be below 10% of someone's total assets, right? So in terms of sizing, we never like to see, be more than 10% of someone's total assets. And then on the flip side of that, I have to take a $500,000 EQ2 through the same underwriting that I have to take a $25 million loan come housing tax credit. So if I think of kind of juice worth the squeeze type thing, we usually try to keep our minimum EQ2 size to a million dollars. And then if you do the back of the math or back of the napkin math there, right, that means that the minimum total asset size I'm generally going to be looking at for a CDFI is 10 million. Um, that doesn't mean it's immediate that that's going to work, right? There's all the other financial ratios, but I would say that's kind of the, the easiest math to follow there. Yeah, thank you. Um, oh, we have another question here. Um, if a bank has a statewide footprint and a CDFI also makes statewide impact and deploys capital throughout a state, would an EQ2 investment by the bank to that CDFI qualify with CRA efforts, or does it need to be more specifically local city branch location based? Do you want me to take that one I'll, first? Yeah, I was I like, I'll answer that from my perspective on yours. So 
This is going to be fully dependent on the type of bank you're going to work with is the first thing I'll state. So as a limited purpose bank with a very small um, CRA footprint, we can start counting activities that are outside of our CRA footprint once we've it, like once we can show that we've met the need in our assessment area, which is Salt Lake. So every everything we do is an EQ2 that is outside of Salt Lake because we've met the need within Salt Lake counts. Um, I don't have to put in any, I, I'm assuming Paul's gonna talk about this, I'd be curious. I don't have to put in any be best efforts language or anything like that that says you have to make a best effort to deploy you know, 50% of this EQ2 in this exact MSA. Um, I'm able to just qualify them nationally. But when you work with the retail bank, which I'll pass it over to Paul, that's going to change a little bit. Yeah, she hit <clears throat> she hit the nail right on the head. So yeah, we do look at it by different assessment areas. So we and in general, uh, kind of the strategy we've utilized: if the CDFI has the capacity to hit certain markets, and they've generally operated. So in Arizona, if you're typically in Arizona or, or navigating around, or even at national, if you could show activity in those, we put language in the agreement that's best efforts to deploy the funds in you know, one, maybe two markets. Uh, somebody asked a question earlier, can you have multiple EQ2s? Back in the day when we first started a program at the bank, we used to do one separate EQ2 agreement per market. So we would say, here's a $500,000 EQ2 for Tucson, here's a $500,000 EQ2 for Phoenix. And then we just got to the point with our examiners where they said, it's okay to do one in a million, just say best efforts at 50-50 and not have to do all the paperwork for doing both. But that is very much driven by, I think, the strategy of the bank in general. And I've seen that some banks uh, do just go straight to a national footprint and some try to keep it right at the, the assessment area. We are one that keeps it at the branch at the market level. And I'll just add a little context. So an assessment area is defined um, by the CRA, by the regulators, and they typically coincide with a county line. Um, so in Arizona, that's pretty easy because we have huge counties. Um, but when you get into um, the East Coast and smaller areas, they tend to be conglomerations of counties or, or things like that. And so um, they typically want to see um, things that are targeted inside of those various assessment areas. So you can think of um, assessment areas as thinking of uh, groups of counties or individual counties. I guess I'm the moderator, so I'm the one that keeps asking questions. Um, so um, some of the other things that um, I think about from, from EQ2s is that I've seen them happen in non-CDFI contexts. Is that common or is that pretty rare? Um, were banks doing naughty things when uh, I saw those non-CDFI non, uh, non investments? So I will state that if you look at what classif what becomes classified as an EQ2, it does not have to be to a CDFI, it has to be to a nonprofit. Um, with that being the case, my bank, and I would assume most banks, are generally CRA motivated, and the CDFI certification is what makes it CRA qualified. So I don't think it was like a, you know, not a true EQ2, but it, uh, I would say most banks this date that I've spoken to are not going to do that because it is not beneficial for Siri purposes. Paul, I'm not sure if you've seen others. <laughs> no, I think it's, it's, I'd say it's extremely rare and just being transparent, I think we have one in our entire portfolio uh, and it was to a parent of the CDFI just to get more financial strength uh, for that particular investment because it was more of a startup CDFI within a larger company. Hey, well, Matt, I saw you come up. Come on. Yeah, if I could share it, I'm just a guest. Um, I was invited by Jill. I'm actually in Florida, so I really appreciate the context. And I have an affinity for Arizona because I adopted my my son from Phoenix two years ago and stayed in Tucson where we were there. So I definitely have a love uh, affair with uh, Arizona now. But uh, but I, I'm going to be a contrarian because we have 10 EQ2s and only two are to CDFIs. Every other one is to a non-CDFI. And, uh, and that was uh, honestly, I'm only four years into the role. And when I first got started, you know, when you read all the, the literature about an EQ2 and what they are, they always refer to it as CDFI. So I was really worried about these investments that I basically took ownership of uh, in the CRA role. 
but we went through an exam in May of last year and every one of them, there's no question about them, largely because what the nonprofit's purpose was, a lot of them were in affordable housing. So for example, one, um, we gave them an EQ2 investment so that they could get rid of their construction line. They were doing new single family affordable development. It's at 2% versus their line was like at eight. Plus, as you probably know, on a construction line, there's lots of administration draws and all sorts of things. So allowed them a fund to where they could basically get rid of that higher higher rate uh, funding and also get rid of some of the administration. And so they were building affordable housing, selling it, liquidating those funds, and then putting them into another house. So um, so I, I do think we are an anomaly, but we do have uh, the majority of ours are not in CDFIs with our institution. Yeah, and I also mentioned that not all banks do um, EQ2s. There are some, even some large banks that that do not and look at other ways of doing investments. And that might be um, how, how Kathleen was mentioning that one um, reimbursable grant or however you termed it. Mm. The patient capital debt. Patient capital one. debt. Yeah, it was essentially an EQ2, but when it renewed um, the term, the term got changed because of how they were reconsidering the, the ideas around maturities and EQ2s. Yeah. And so, um, I, uh, Irby, I saw that you had asked about this. I'm sure we can send the presentation out. Um, I can get the list of emails from Frida and um, send this out to anyone who attended. And then um, the other part of these coffee chats is really, um, or what they usually are is just a time where we come together and ask questions and, and be able to just talk about it as, um, as nonprofits or as financial institutions, typically it's mostly financial institutions where we come in and talk about like, hey, this issue is coming up. I got this question from the regulator. I'm reading this uh, um, code different. I was talking to this nonprofit. They're not a good fit for, um, for our organization for a grant, but I love them. Annie, I think that that would be a great fit for you. Um, can I connect you with them? You know, those kind of things. But, you know, in the little time that we have left, I would love to um, open it up to um, conversation with anyone here. And um, if there are any questions or things like that, and um, maybe Frida, you can stop recording at this point. So uh, 